Hi everybody, uh, I know some of you, some of you don't know me. My name is uh, Glenn Wright. I'm a systems architect, so I'm here to help facilitate the sort of uh, optimization of the uh, KDB KX solution on various different sets of hardware. One of the first things that uh, I ended up doing was working with the uh, cloud. So quick summary of uh, the current status with uh, cloud and uh, KDB. Uh, as some of you may know, some time ago we published on the KX, code.kx.com site a white paper on migrating your HDB to EC2. Um, I'll give a little bit of an update on that. We have also have some public benchmarks primarily with uh, the Stack Group, Stack M3. I'll very briefly mention that. And then there's a little bit of an update on KDB in the marketplace on AWS. And then we'll hand over to Rebecca. One of the, I think, most interesting parts of tonight is a demonstration of how we will uh, enable on-demand in, um, in Amazon. OK, so briefly on the existing white paper, I wanted to just characterize what we've done here because that's kind of the important point here. You can go download the uh, white paper if you haven't seen it and uh, send me any comments on that or if there's any additional features, file systems, or options that you'd like us to test in the next version of this, please let us know. This is all for enabling uh, less trial and error on your side by us hopefully uh, covering a lot of this for you. We covered off uh, basic CPU memory features by and large for a classic RDB model. You should see no particular issues between comparing your equivalent system in premises and an equivalent system in uh, EC2. There's a few nuances there, so I'll leave you to re read through that. But by and large, what you see on your in-premises system, you'll see the same attributes for CPU and memory uh, latency. A little bit of a variation on storage, as you might expect with a virtualized model. And we characterize that in four ways. So first of all, the sort of standard storage you get from uh, Amazon, such as EBS, Elastic Block Storage, and EFS, and Storage Gateway, sort of as a service, you kind of click and go and get that. Um, this is a typical location for your uh, HDB files. And so you can get this working straight away out the box. Some limitations of that may be that you're not necessarily sharing the data. If you have a sharding model, that's fine. And then we have a couple of examples of sort of existing scalable file systems which are now available on the EC2 marketplace. We evaluated a couple of those, MAPR and Quobyte. MAPR came from the Hadoop world. The third category, we had a lot of questions from you on S3. So Goof is S3FS, S3QL. A bunch of open source, some of you would have played with that, some of you may not. So the point about that is you can pretty much pick up from the GitHub that code, install it in the same instance that you're running KDB in, and off you go. Some of the more interesting ones are uh, uh, Objective FS, Weka IO. We've got uh, a couple of guys from both of those companies here today. The difference with this is um, you're actually s sort of able to tier your storage, uh, have a high performance POSIX layer, and tier your storage out to, to S3. One thing I'd like to note is for this uh, event, we've leveraged a shared file system called FSX from uh, Amazon. That's uh, gone on to their portfolio, what, a couple of months back. And for the purposes of this demo, we're just going to show you how, you how you would use that. So you can click on the service there. Rebecca will show you how to do that shortly. And uh, we've shared that file system across multiple nodes. I wanted to give a shout out for the recent benchmarks. These are extremely important to us and I hope to you. Uh, these are primarily focused at financial services clients and represent classic uh, queries that you guys run. On the top, I wanted to have a shout out for Intel. They've been partnering with us for some long time. Most of you guys will be based on Intel today, so I would imagine. The point about the top benchmark run last fall was that uh, things like traditionally something that was kind of slightly more awkward for um, a vector processing engines such as KDB was things like MarketSnap. And we found with their latest storage technology, Optane, probably a lot of you have played with it already. But basically, the latency of some of the key snappy sort of small read functions have decreased dramatically by about 98%. A couple of benchmarks there in the fall, what fundamentally represent two aspects of running a single large instance. So uh, Intel actually compared running a large instance against a previous instance of a Broadwell chipset. And the response, the, the results were pretty favorable. There were some actually outperformed, some matched, some were slightly lower. And it's kind of what you would expect. So good, good shout out there for large memory footprint. This particular server was, I think, six or seven gigabytes, oh, sorry, um, terabytes of RAM. 
The one at the bottom is also of interest in that it's an instantiation of a distributed query HDB implementation on Google Cloud. We basically uh, ran that and compared it to an NFS system. So a couple of, um, a lot of this does apply to Amazon also. You could abstract a whole bunch of nodes with local storage and run your distributed query accordingly. And you should get favorable results. So go to the website, all the full details are there. Most of you guys are members. KDB Plus on uh, EC2 Marketplace. I would say you can do this in your sleep. So you can go straight to the marketplace, bring up an instance, choose your instance size. There's three or four examples here on the bottom. Could have one core, two cores, four cores, whatever. And you're billed by the minutes, the hours that the instance is up and available. You know exactly what the uh, sort of expense line will be on it and exactly what you expect up front. Very, very useful for development, short bursty projects or peak periods. So if you want to supplement perhaps your enterprise license, a uh, good way of doing it. But I particularly like, uh, we're, we're actually going to show you this demonstration today right now, and that's based on this model. So we've spun up a number of instances using the standard license and the standard image which we've pulled down from Marketplace. So with that, I shall hand it over. I am going to talk to you about uh, KX on the cloud and how it works on the cloud and what features in the language are going to enable you to really um, get the best out of running KDB on the cloud. Cloud to me and to most of you is all about scale. How are you going to scale efficiently? How are you going to make the most out of um, the resources you have and pay for them efficiently and use them well? So there's a number of changes that have come into the language recently which will really enable people to get the most out of it. Um, so the most recent one is the deferred response. The way this works is if, you, you know, in your traditional gateway, um, people are sending in synchronous requests. This will let you basically stick a pin in it and come back to it. So you can say, hang on there. Um, the other process, the one that was querying synchronously, um, they'll just wait while you do whatever you like, and then you can eventually come back to them if you want it. It basically means that you don't need to put changes in on your connecting processes to deal with um, asynchronous uh, requests in that fashion. You can take these synchronous requests and then farm them out and leave your gateway free. So when I show you later the demo, um, I'll be using this to basically free up my gateway to just uh, parse out these requests and then um, you, because of the freedom of the gateway, I'll be able to then measure the throughput and decide whether I need to open another instance or not and so on. So you can start with a certain number of slaves and you can shrink that down, you can expand that out. Um, you just need to start with the maximum you think you're gonna need. As I said, this is kind of your standard setup. You've got your on-disk layer, in this case it's on the cloud with KX. And for us, as Glenn mentioned, this is us using the AWS Luster. And there's your gateway, which is going to be your entry point to these HDBs. Three of your HDBs are sleeping. Those are eyelashes, because they're all sleepy. So you get your synchronous request, your gateway handles it, pings off all of the queries asynchronously. Um, and then whenever those come back, it serves that back to your uh, synchronous call. Your gateway is free to um, deal with uh, tracking the load. And whenever that's necessary, it's going to wake up some of these sleepy little guys. The second demo that we won't actually get to that I'll talk to now is you'll start with four slaves and then you'll reassign back immediately to one. So if you think about it, a lot of people, like you, you know yourselves that load isn't always constant. Um, you're going to see spikes throughout the day a lot of the time. In an ideal world, if you were just going to pay for what you used, you would have one HDB that would be running one slave for part of the day, and then you'd have another that would run four when you needed it, and then you'd go back to the one that was running one. But nobody really writes their systems like that because you need 24-7 availability, and to do that would be a lot of hassle and probably more prone to failure, so why would you do that? So in this case, what you can do is you can start with the four, um, go, shrink to this one, and then whenever you need it, you flex up. This is a bit of a pun. Yeah, so that's basically it. I'm going to go to the live demo now. So here we have our AWS instance. Uh, these are a couple of EC2 instances that we're running at the moment. This meetup demo client one is the one where I'm going to connect to now in a second. I'm going to start the gateway process and um, you guys can kind of see it in action. 
just to show you, here is in this FSX, this is our Lustre file system where we have our data on disk. I'll come back to that when I connect. Okay, great. Um, perfect. So I'm going to just connect to it. AWS has a lot of very good security. So we, I'm using a PEM key here, and I just have this in my SSH config. Um, so I'm connected. There we go. I'm live. And you can see that we have mounted this file system. I should point at this. Uh, here, this guy. Um, he's our Lustre FSX. Um, Great. Uh, so these instances on EC2 are the marketplace instances. So I haven't, well, obviously I've done some stuff here already, but I assure you that you get this, you start it up, and you can just start queue. And it runs. Um, nothing major there. So I'm going to load my HTTP. Um, and I've got a number of different tables here. So. For instance, my quote table, I think, has 5 billion uh, records. This is just the standard TAQ um, script that was used to generate this data. OK. Uh, so what I do have, well, here's one I prepared earlier, um, are some scripts that will uh, utilize some of the functionality I was talking about. Um, so the main thing of interest here is that we are using here this minus 30 bang. So this is my dot, dot, dot PG handler. I'm sure most of you are you know, quite technically familiar with KX. Um, but this is the one that handles the incoming synchronous uh, requests for those of you who aren't. Um, and so basically, when I get this request through, I'm making a note. I'm, I'm checking which handle is most free. I am going to go ahead and assign it to this request. And I, send, I, I basically tell it to wait while I go and farm it out. And that's what I do here. And further up, you can see where I am doing the query processing. This is, this is going to get run on my, uh, on my remote process. And then it's going to call this callback function here, which then um, basically hands back to the client the result. So I am going to kick off that process. Yeah, actually, I have my scripts in here. OK, so uh, just for the sake of showing you, I'm starting with uh, 16 slaves. When I connect, I'll show you that, that, that I'm shrinking that down as part of my, uh, my timer process that I am running. I'm saying it's dynamic, which in this code tells it that whenever load increases, go ahead and spin up a new instance. And I'm starting with just one base instance. So if I go ahead and run this code and then initialize my load balancing code, um, you'll see that it says, oh, we're not at our base level. Go ahead and start an AWS instance. So I've got a couple of print commands in to make this more clear. So you can see right now that Meetup Demo Client 2 has now started. It's initializing. Um, and here we go. I've, the connection has now been established from that instance. So I'm keeping track of that in this dictionary. So here is my, my handle to that instance. And now I can serve queries and farm them out there. So I've also done a little bit of port forwarding. Um, so this gateway, which I started on 2001, um, I forwarded to my local 2001. And I've got this script here, which is just going to open a connection to this and do something you know, terrifying, which is query that quote table, which was 5 billion records without a, without a date because I just want to simulate a bit, of, a bit of load here. But you know, don't do this. This is demonstration only. <laughs> um, so where am I here? Yeah. So I'm just going to kick that off. Mm -hmm. And now if I have a look, you can see that um, this 7 actually shows me that a query is, has come in from this process here. Um, this is just the handle back to that one. Um, and it's basically executing against that. So you can see that that's running. So let's simulate a little bit of extra load. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to start another one of those. So there's a number of different ways in which you can deal with load 
on your gateways. So what you can do is, uh, I'll just show you. Now we've got a query queued up behind there. Um, there's a timer running, and uh, once it realizes that the load is increased, it's going to start up another instance. So yeah, you can see it started another instance. So I'm going to go back here, refresh. Excellent, we are up and running. So, uh, and the connection has now been established. So the query is a hefty one. Once it uh, completes, we'll see it now getting apportioned out to my new handle. So it's balancing now between those two instances. Um, and obviously you can you know, have more sensible queries and extend this in, uh, in clever ways. When I shut this down, excellent, you can see now that this, uh, this extra process that I spun up is now basically waiting. It's not really doing anything. I, I can't remember exactly what frequency I have my timer set to, but you know, nothing, nothing too crazy. Um, at some point, it'll kind of have a look and it'll say, well, this process is doing nothing. Why am I paying for a process that's doing nothing? And it will uh, shut that down. And the whole idea with this is that you only have to pay for what you're using and you can respond to uh, load that exists in your system um, pretty, pretty easily. And you, you see yourselves at the kind of response times um, well, I don't have timing up here, which I probably should have added, but you can see that the response time in terms of when you spin it up to when you, um, to when the process actually connects is actually not so bad. So we're obviously, yeah, so here, this guy has stopped um, or is stopping. We're using instances that we've already created, so you pay like a nominal amount for whatever the kind of footprint is of that instance, but you only really pay for it when it's running with the AWS. Uh, command line interface, you can, you can spin up entirely new processes that don't exist here. Some people prefer to have like a pre-configured list of instances that they can work with. Um, it's really up to, up to yourself. So this is the demo of dynamic load balancing. <laughs>